Chapter Four of Thou Art the Man. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Thou Art the Man by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter Four A Mariage de Convenance. Two and thirty years before that bleak October afternoon, on which Coralie Urquhart discanted in her journal, Sir Joseph Higginson, of Arlington Street and Ellerslie Park, startled his friends and neighbours by an, by an aristocratic alliance, and the bringing home of a lovely girl-wife, to reign over his country house near Ardliston. Sir Joseph was forty-nine years of age at the time of his marriage, plain of face and clumsy of figure. But he was one of the wealthiest pit owners in the north of England, and if his immediate surroundings were surprised at this union, Society in London regarded the marriage as the most natural thing in life. Here was the Earl of Allendale, on the one part, with a large family, the offspring of two poorly dowered wives, and here was a millionaire of mature years, against whose position nothing could be said except that he had made it for himself and against whose moral character no slander had ever reached the ear of the great world. Decidedly, pronounced society, Lord Allendale had done wisely in uniting his youngest daughter, youngest of a family of eleven, to Sir Joseph Higginson. The young lady herself was never heard to complain, Whatever dream she had cherished of a different union was a dream that had found its own tearful ending before she saw the lord of those Cumbrian pits. She was told that her acceptance of Sir Joseph would be advantageous to her family, as well as an assurance of high fortune to herself. He could help her brothers, some of whom were public officials, while the more enterprising of the band dabbled in trade and exhibited their patrician name upon the prospectuses of newly launched companies. She, as his wife, could be useful to her sisters, since his spacious mansion in Arlington Street would offer a better stage for matrimonial efforts than the somewhat shabby old house in Mayfair, which the Mountforts maintained with a struggle, and whose chief merit was to be found in certain unsavory traditions of old-world scandals, duels, elopements, family quarrels, forced marriages, which clung to the panelled walls of those low-ceilinged rooms in which Lord Allendale's ancestors had lived and loved and hated and suffered for more than two centuries. Lord Allendale professed an affectionate pride in the house because his family had held it so long, but he was fain to confess that it was inconvenient and insanitary, and it cost him a plaguy lot of money to keep the roof from tumbling in and the windows from falling out. If I were to sell the old gazebo to a pork butcher from Chicago, he would pull it down and build a little palace on the site, or scoop out the inside and restore it in the style of the seventeenth century, said his lordship. But I shan't part with it while I have a shot in the locker, and we must pig in it as best we can. Pigging was not an elegant expression but it seemed hardly inappropriate, for the upper floors were divided into bedchambers, 
not much larger than a modern pigsty, and of inconvenient shapes for the most part, in which the ladies Mountford and their honourable brothers were almost as crowded as an Irish peasant's household amid the fertile field of Kerry. For compensation they had Basingstoke House, a great barrack in Hampshire, on a windy hill westward of Basingstoke, where there were five and thirty inconvenient bedrooms. Lady Lucy Mountfort submitted to fate in the person of Sir Joseph Higginson, and became at once mistress of the house in Arlington Street, palatial, splendid, rich in all things that make the outward grace and glory of life, and of Ellerslie Park in Cumberland, a colossal Tudor mansion designed by an architect of the highest fashion, who would not suffer the smallest alteration of his plans. It had been discovered, or at any rate alleged later, that the fashionable architect was a fraud, that his Tudor houses were none of them genuinely Tudor, but only Tudoresque, and he had stolen his flashiest ideas from the sober Flemings of Antwerp and Ghent. Notwithstanding which condemnation from the ever-advancing critic, who was always getting beyond the perfection of yesterday, Ellerslie was a remarkable house in a very fine situation with turrets and broad embayed windows that looked wide over land and sea sir joseph owned most of the land to be seen from these windows and he owned a whole district of collieries and collier's cottages which were happily unseen by the inmates of ellerslie which lay in the furthermost dip of the long low hill he was the wealthiest man and the largest landowner in that part of the country, and he was not without his enemies. No prosperous man ever escapes the hatred of the unsuccessful. It is the bright day that brings forth the adder. Sir Joseph was as popular as most county magistrates and employers of labor, but it was said of him that he was a hard man, and that he never accepted less than twelve pence for his shilling. He had begun life as a toiler in those pits of which he was now owner. It was said of him that everything he touched turned to gold, that he had Satan's luck as well as his own, but this is an assertion commonly made about every man from whom small beginnings attains to gigantic wealth. The world sees only the speculator's success, but does not see, or at least readily forgets, the failures and disappointments that made the game of speculation difficult. It keeps no count of the hours of heart-sinking, when the fortune already won trembled in the balance, and when it was only by hazarding all that the game could be saved. Joseph Higginson was talked of as a modern Midas, and very few people knew or remembered what arduous stages there had been on that long uphill road to the pinnacle of success. He knew and remembered that he had been more than once on the verge of bankruptcy, and that he had more than once risked the game of life upon a single throw. He had shown himself a man of infinite resources, keen observation, and he was said to have the gift of prophecy in a degree granted to but few financiers. He had reached the age of forty-nine, ostensibly a bachelor, and had gratified his nephews and nieces, most of whom he had helped to rise considerably from their original status, by the assertion often repeated that he would never marry, when, 
a chance meeting in the boardroom of an insurance company where he was chairman brought about an acquaintance with lord allandale who was one of the directors your impecunious nobleman is apt to incline toward the low-born millionaire and allandale flattered sir joseph by telling him how much he had heard about his work in the north and how interested he was in seeing the man who had done such good work an invitation to a little dinner at his lordship's house in hartford street followed a few days later it was a man's dinner and sir joseph hardly hoped to see the ladies of the family but four out of the party of six left soon after ten o'clock three to go to the house where there was an important division coming on and the fourth to look in at three or four smart dances whereupon lord allandale proposed an adjournment to the drawing-room i don't know whether you know my wife he said she goes out a good deal more than i do i have met her ladyship at parties but i have never had the honour of an introduction answered sir joseph meekly come up and be introduced now said the earl cheerily sir joseph laid down his half-smoked cigar on the old derby dessert plate he had observed that in noble families however impecunious one always found old china and queen anne silver to excite the envy of the newly rich he laid down his cigar and pulled himself together smoothing down the wrinkles in his white waistcoat he was a stout man short-necked broad-shouldered and always wore a white waistcoat whether the thing were in or out of fashion excellent or intolerable he followed his host up the narrow Mayfair staircase, which was decorated with those shabby family pictures and engravings of country houses which indicate widespread connections and a long history. How different, he thought, to his staircase in Arlington Street, where all was newly splendid, created at a blow by one sweep of the upholsterer's hand, here portraits miniatures battle pieces in which mountfords had figured views of country seats were stuck about anyhow on casual nails the drawing-room low and roomy occupying the whole of the first floor seemed full of women and yet there was no one but lady allandale and her daughters a flock of young women in gauzy white gowns with a general impression of white azaleas and ostrich feathers standing about before the looking-glasses pluming themselves ready for conquest while they waited for the big family carriage that was to take them to a ball they reminded sir joseph of a group of beautiful swans pruning their plumage on the bosom of a summer lake he was lost in admiration of the general effect rather than of individual beauty he could scarcely command his attention while he was being introduced to a large lady in peach-coloured brocade and diamonds who was putting on a glove that seemed decidedly too small for the fat and jewelled hand it was required to cover the hand came out of the glove and offered itself in the friendliest way to sir joseph i think sir joseph and i knew each other very well before to-night though we had not been introduced said lady allandale you were sitting next to me at luncheon the day they launched the harmonia i remember and we were near neighbours at lady downton's big dinner-party the other day sir joseph assented smilingly he adored a peeress, wherever he met one. I had the honour of taking in Lady Hetherington. What? 
Amanda, my stepdaughter, she is always charming. Let me introduce you to my daughters, Sir Joseph. Lady Selina, Lady Laura, Lady Jane, Lady Rosina. The four white swans smilingly accepted the introduction with gracious bendings of slender throats. Lady Selina was the eldest of the brood, a very mature swan. The room was too dimly lighted to allow Sir Joseph to note the difference in their ages. The Mountfords were a race renowned for good looks, and to the millionaire's eye the four sisters appeared equally beautiful. And then he suddenly perceived a girl sitting at the piano in a pale blue cashmere frock. Pale blue was a favorite color thirty years ago. A girl with her hair swept back from her fair sweet face in a careless bunch of long loose curls tied up with a blue ribbon. A girl in whose face and candid eyes looking up at him across the piano he saw a loveliness infinitely beyond the grandiose beauty of the four swans. That is my youngest daughter, Sir Joseph, said Lady Allendale, following his eyes. She has not yet left the schoolroom. Lady Lucy rose shyly embarrassed by the gaze of sir joseph's great brown eyes eyes that reminded her of a friendly ox in basingstoke park she and sir joseph stood looking at each other for a few moments equally embarrassed almost as if some instinct of mind or heart foreshadowed the union of their lives she gave him her hand tremulously under the spell of his earnest gaze or the presage of her fate the youngest of many daughters is doomed to flower late and lady lucy despite her cashmere frock and schoolroom status was nineteen and had her own little history not altogether of the schoolroom a history which gave a touch of pathos to the lily face. A lovely young creature, but I am afraid she's rather sickly, was Sir Joseph's unspoken commentary. He was only allowed ten minutes in this elysium of fashionable Uri. Her ladyship's carriage was announced, and the white daughters crowded down the staircase followed by the ampler mother on whose footsteps sir joseph and lord allendale attended sir joseph paused on the landing while her ladyship's bulky form was slowly descending and addressed himself in parting speech to the damsel from the schoolroom i'm afraid you must feel very envious of your sisters at such a moment as this lady lucy he said i don't see why all girls should be supposed to be fond of dancing she answered rather pettishly i don't care about it and you are not longing for next season when you will be presented i suppose no Lucy has seen too much of it all from the outside, said Lord Allendale, patting a graceful shoulder in the blue frock. She is disillusioned before her time. Come, Sir Joseph, if you really mean to vote with your party tonight, you'd better be off. Your carriage has been at the door for the last half hour. This was the beginning of Sir Joseph's acquaintance with lady lucy mountford they were married early in the ensuing season at the church in piccadilly where daffodils were still blooming in the basingstoke meadows 
it was a very grand wedding and all london talked of the marriage some people descanting on the cruelty and wickedness of so ill-assorted a union others expatiating upon the wonderful match lord allandale had secured for this portionless youngest and a third section declaring that he ought to have done better for her a girl of such remarkable beauty ought to have looked higher than a man who began life in a coal pit said one of lady allandale's dearest friends but if the man has got out of the pit and made a big fortune in coals i don't think a woman with five daughters need complain of her luck said another a woman with five daughters ought to consider herself lucky when she gets off one of the five remarked a third matron with some asperity being herself the mother of an only daughter and a reputed beauty who had been hawked all through england and over half the continent of europe without satisfactory result the allandales were content with their bargain and so was sir joseph he had taken pains to make himself agreeable to the young lady in every manner that came within the limits of his capacity he had consulted her tastes and feelings deferred to her wishes and let her understand that the life she was to lead with him would be a life of perfect independence and wide liberty she was to be not his slave but his queen she laughed at first at the idea of sir joseph as her adorer and in her girlish talk with her sisters treated the whole affair as a joke but his earnestness and honesty were not without their influence upon her mind and after a long and serious conversation with her mother in which lady allandale lifted the decent veil which had been spread over the financial position of the family and showed her youngest daughter the bleak and barren prospect which lay before her and her sisters unless some of them married well and were able to help the others lady lucy gave a resigned sigh and promised that she would try to like sir joseph well enough to marry him lucy adored her mother and was fond of her sisters though they were of the world worldly she had dreamed her dream and had done with with all such dreams for ever she told herself sir joseph's rugged honesty of purpose had won her esteem and if it were indeed her destiny to marry for the welfare of her family and to lessen the burden upon her father's dwindling income it would be well for her that she should marry an honest man whom she could at least respect love being for evermore impossible she had seen the young men of her mother's circle seen them from her privileged position as a young person still in the schoolroom who was free to sit in the background and look on as at a play and she had been impressed by their shallowness and self-assurance she preferred the conversation of sir joseph who sometimes misplaced an aspirate but who always talked sensibly and never pretended to more knowledge than he possessed to the vacuous slaying of youth that had graduated on suburban race courses learnt dancing at after midnight clubs and received its final polish in london music halls when sir joseph after wooing her in his own fashion with supreme delicacy asked her in simplest language to be his wife she answered with a gentle candour which completed his subjugation she told him that she had given her whole heart away a year ago in a happy summer time at basingstoke house given it unasked and almost unaware of her own feelings till she awoke to the bitterness and despair of having loved a man who never wooed her and who was not free to be her lover 
she told her little story of a girl's romance falteringly and toward the end with tears which she struggled heroically to suppress i am afraid he guessed my wretched secret she said burning blushes suffusing cheek and brow as she sat by sir joseph's side with lowered eyelids one cold and trembling hand clasped in those broad sinewy hands of his which had never lost the markings of early toil i am afraid he read my heart only too well we are distant cousins sir joseph and he was almost as familiar as a brother would have been one day he said very secret seriously that he had a secret to tell me i had seen for ever so long that he was unhappy that the shadow of some hidden grief would creep over him in the midst of our gaiety when everything in life seemed made for happiness i was hardly surprised when he told me that he was a miserable man early in life before he left the university that he had married foolishly that one word was all he ever said to me about his marriage he had never owned that marriage to his people but he had done his duty or at least he hoped he had done his duty to his wife a son was born and soon after his birth the poor mother went out of her mind and then her husband found that there had been madness in her family he had done what was right he assured me he had placed her in the best and kindest care and he had hoped for her recovery although the doctors gave him very little ground for hope years had gone by and the case was now pronounced hopeless her mind was gone but her physical health promised long life there was no such thing as divorce in such a case as this he was her husband to the end of his life did he tell you that he loved you asked sir joseph under his breath no 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 protested the girl eagerly not by one word not by one look then he is a good man and deserves a better fate god reward you my dear for having opened your heart to me i am not afraid to try and guard that pure heart from every temptation that can assail an old man's wife if you only like me well enough to trust yourself to my loving care lucy if i am to marry at all i would rather be your wife than any one else's she answered gravely and thus ended sir joseph's courtship from that hour till the last hour of her life lady lucy never complained of her portion in this world sir joseph kept his promise in the spirit as well as to the letter he was a devoted husband and his wife reigned as a queen in that northern settlement where the name of higginson was a charm to con conjure with she had her model village where even the men and boys who worked in the pits were able to live with some degree of comfort she had her schools and a church of her own creation built and endowed at sir joseph's cost her cottage hospital her almshouses for the aged and helpless within that small kingdom she was worshipped as a saint and in arlington street she was able to hold her own with her contemporaries and equals in the social maelstrom while she had the proud privilege of helping three of her sisters marry creditably and comfortably and thereby to reflect honour upon the house of mountford if having married rank rather than money those ladies were 
inclined to look down upon their worthy brother-in-law sir joseph never allowed resentment to harden his heart or tighten his purse-strings against them or their belongings he let the husbands fish in his salmon river and shoot his pheasants and he let the wives ride his horses and recuperate their exhausted energies in the comfort of his country house he never refused to become sponsor for any of their numerous babies nor ever withheld the expected goblet or porringer of solid gold in a word he used his wealth in a large-minded fashion and succeeded in being talked of by his four sisters-in-law throughout the length and breadth of society as a dear old thing sir joseph had been married three, nearly three years when a son and heir was born in the great grey tudor house at ellerslie a son whose advent brought joy unspeakable to the father's great honest heart but this flower in the garden of domestic life was a pale and fragile blossom and drooped and withered before the end of a year in the following year there came a daughter but the father who had seen his hopes blasted was slow to let his love go out to this newcomer he was afraid of loving her too well lest he should be called upon to suffer the anguish of a second bereavement the girl baby throve however and was the delight of her mother's life the all-absorbing occupation and amusement of lady lucy's happiest years millet's picture of mother and daughter hangs in the hall of Calander castle to which mansion it was transferred after sir joseph's death the portrait of a woman in the full flush of mature beauty with a tall willowy girl in a pinafore leaning against her mother's shoulder with sunny tresses ruffled after some childish sport in solemn dreaming eyes the eyes which shining starlight in the baby face had won for her the name of sibyl sibyl was eleven when that picture was painted and before her twelfth birthday the picture was all that remained to sir joseph of his loved and lovely wife she died in the pride of her strength and beauty being thrown out of the light phaeton which she had driven for years in perfect safety a nervous horse a narrow road a great coal wagon in the way and swift sudden death for the woman whom sir joseph higginson had worshipped with unwavering devotion from the hour she laid her hand in his and accepted him as her husband if she had not given him the love that youth gives to youth she had at least been true and steadfast throughout all their years of wedded life she had shown no sign of weariness or disgust she had never de depreciated her husband or hinted at her own superiority by right of early training and patrician birth she had carried with meekness and yet with dignity the power which great wealth gives to the mistress of a household her husband's life had been rounded into perfect harmony by this woman and in losing it seemed to joseph higginson as if there were nothing left for his gray hairs but to go down in sorrow to the grave he was of too tough a fibre for grief to kill he went on living somehow though the light was quenched in the lamp and the music was dead in the lute he had tried to comfort himself with the love of his daughter his only child and heiress sibyl who grew in beauty as the years ripened and waned she was very tender and devoted to him but she could not fill the empty place in his heart 
only one had he loved with the whole strength of his rugged nature and she was gone he took to money-making as the one pursuit that brought distraction occupation fatigue of brain and soothing sleep as a sequence of labour he had long ago made his fortune and ruled off the total of a life's industry eminently satisfied with the result but now he entered himself afresh in the race for gold and stung by the grief that gnawed his heart-strings he who had hitherto been cautious in all of his investments speculated wildly and by a curious irony of fate was successful in every enterprise during those years of his widowhood his name was a power on the stock exchange and men flung their money eagerly into any scheme in which he was interested he was said to have trebled his fortune in that headlong race to him the business of money-getting had superseded every other interest personal or general the stock exchange was his card-table and he played the game of speculation with all the passionate concentration of the habitual gambler the man who is a gambler and nothing else during this period of financial activity sir joseph lived for two-thirds of each year in arlington street preferring to be near the scene of action within a half-hour drive of the actual money market but his mines were still something to him and he spent the last of the summer months and the whole of the autumn at ellerslie park where sibyl lived with her two governesses miss minchin a homely english person who had been with her pupil from the nurse, nursery days of reading lessons in words of one syllable and fraulein stahlherz an accomplished hanoverian who was familiar with almost every phrase of wagner's orchestration played all beethoven's sonatas that are playable on the pianoforte knew goethe and schiller by heart was mistress of french and italian to say nothing of english which she spoke more correctly than any one else at ellerslie under this lady's conscientious tuition and with the faithful minchin to minister to her comforts to look after her health and to see that she never sat in damp boots or suffered from chilblains that the dentist was consulted at regular intervals and that tonics were exhibited at the least indication of languor Sibyl had grown to eighteen years of age before it occurred to her father that she was a young woman and that she had a right to take her place in the world as his daughter. She would have to be presented at court and introduced to society, that society upon which Sir Joseph had persistently turned his back ever since his wife's death. The idea that of this necessity worried and embarrassed him. His wife's mother, Lady Allendale, was dead. Her son's wife, Lady Brymar, was a person whose house was eminently fashionable, but by no means the most fitting house for girlish innocence. Sir Joseph felt that the time was at hand when he must provide a chaperone for his daughter. There was one ready to his hand in the person of her spinster aunt, Lady Selina Mountford, a lady of small means, very well received in the best of circles and familiar with all the works and ways of the great world he felt the difficulty of the position all the more because there was somebody else to be thought of at ellerslie a young woman who without sir joseph having ever intended as much had become in some wise an adopted elder sister of sibyl's who had shared all the privileges of Fräulein Stahlherz's erudition, and some slender portion of Miss Minchin's assiduity, and who, albeit seven years older than Sibyl, was still young enough to feel the contrast between the social importance of the great heiress and her own insignificance. A year after Lady Lucy's death, the two governesses and their pupil were startled one dull wintry afternoon by the appearance of a mouldy leathern vehicle drawn by a knock-kneed bay horse 
and popularly known in the district as the station fly on the box of the station fly and almost obscuring the driver was a large grey trunk metal bound and of foreign aspect governess and pupil stared at this phenomenon from the bay window of the spacious schoolroom and as they stared the elderly coachman descended painfully from his box and opened the door of the vehicle whereupon there came out of the leathern darkness a fresh face with rose-red cheeks and slow black eyes and a bush of black hair brushed upward from a broad square forehead this bright and vivid countenance was set upon the well-shaped figure of a young woman who might be at any age between eighteen and twenty-five she was tall broad-chested with finely rounded arms that showed under her close-fitting black stuff gown she was clad wholly in black a dense black which looked like deep mourning although she wore no crape her dress was plain to puritanism she must be a new housemaid said miss minchin but ball ought to know better than to bring her to the hall door ball had dragged the stranger's trunk up the steps into the porch by this time while the footman looked on the newcomer disappeared within the great stone porch ball the flyman clambered on to the box the fly drove off and sibyl and her governesses went back to their various occupations fraulein to the perusal of the last number of the rundschau and miss minchin to an elaborate task of needlework on her own account being the reconstruction of her last summer's sunday silk gown and sibyl to her practice of one of chopin's mazurkas no more was to be seen of the dark-eyed young woman for a week when sibyl met her one afternoon in a passage near the housekeeper's room they looked at each other with mutual interest open on the part of sibyl furtive on the part of the stranger could she be a servant sibyl wondered assuredly not a housemaid for the housemaids at ellerslie park all wore livery of lavender cotton in the morning and were white capped and aproned all day this young woman was capless and apronless the bloom on her cheeks had faded somewhat since the day she alighted from the station fly her dark eyes had a troubled look sibyl was on her way to the housekeeper's room to ask for something for a sick child in one of those cottages which had been her mother's kingdom and over which she now reigned a youthful queen will you send little jane barber soup once a day and jelly and custard pudding on alternate days miss morrison she asked of the comfortable-looking housekeeper whose ordinarily placid countenance was furrowed by her strenuous study of the butcher's book yes ma'am soup and jelly shall be sent poor little mite i'm afraid she's not long for this world is there anything else i can do miss sibyl mrs morrison's address fluctuated between the formal ma'am and the affectionate miss sibyl she had kept sir joseph's house when the heiress was born and worshipped her accordingly yes mrs morrison there is something i very much want you to do for me required replied sibyl quickly tell me all about that pretty young woman in black who came here in a fly just a week ago mrs morrison's brow grew even more troubled than it had been over the butcher's book indeed miss sibyl i can't tell you much not if i was to tell you all i know the young person dropped from the clouds as one might say i hadn't had one word of notice of her coming from sir joseph or anybody else and if she hadn't brought me a letter from him i might have taken her for an impostor and turned her out of doors a letter from father 
do let me see it is he coming soon i am so longing for him he doesn't say a word about coming home ma'am the letter is all about the young woman let me see let me see sibyl cried eagerly holding out her hand for the letter mrs morrison had to unlock a desk and to select the sad letter from among various other documents a slow business and seeming slower to sibyl's impatience at last however the letter was produced taken out of the envelope carefully enfolded and reperused by mrs morrison before she handed it to her master's daughter sibyl read as follows the carlton thursday evening my good morrison marie arnold the bearer of this letter has been lately left an orphan and i have taken it upon myself to provide her with a home she is of humble birth and has no grand expectations it is my wish therefore that while giving her a comfortable home at ellerslie and taking her as much as possible under your own wing you should not allow her to acquire any fine notions or to fancy herself a young lady you will be kind enough to find her some light employment in the household if she is clever with her needle as i am told she is you might allow her to be useful to miss higginson and in the schoolroom generally i am told that she has been well educated in a convent school in the south of france where she was born she is a roman catholic i hope this fact will not be used to her prejudice and that she will be encouraged to attend the services of her own church so long as she herself desires to remember to remain a member of that church you will please provide her wardrobe and give her a reasonable amount of pocket money she will of course have a bedroom of her own and not be placed on a footing with servants yours sincerely j h not on a footing with the servants repeated mrs morrison and sibyl handed her the letter there's my difficulty you see miss find her a light occupation keep her ideas humble and yet not make a servant of her it isn't easy yes it is you dear old morrison let her be in the schoolroom and have her bedroom near the schoolroom and let her come and sit with me in my own room very often in my recreation hours i like her looks and if she is french she will help me improve my french conversation and she can tell me all about the south and she can go for long rambles with me miss minchin and the fraulein are wretched creatures to go out with neither of them knows the meaning of the word ramble they can only walk tell marie to come to my room this afternoon at half past two i am free from then till four and she and i can have a good talk not allow her to acquire fine notions or to fancy herself a lady repeated the housekeeper reading a passage from sir joseph's letter with a puzzled brow i don't know how that will hold with letting her be your companion to go out walking with you or to be with you in your sitting-room i don't know if that will quite answer to sir joseph's instructions miss sibyl but i do father means that marie and i are to be friendly or he would never have suggested her being useful in this schoolroom the schoolroom means me she shall be useful she shall help me to support the burden of two governesses that will be a work of real utility cried sibyl with a happy laugh mrs morrison had heard that joyous laughter very seldom since lady lucy's death and her heart warmed at the sound the girl had been the sunshine of the house before that bitter parting between devoted mother and adoring child but that great grief had clouded the joyous nature and 
for the greater part of the year of mourning it may be said that sibyl endured life rather than that she had lived the sound of her own laughter shocked her even to-day she looked down at her black frock and stifled sob oh how can i feel happy even for an instant she murmured in self-reproach when she is gone i'll send the young person to your room at half-past two precisely said mrs morrison with a cheery air and i shall be grateful to her my pretty one if she helps you to forget your loss mused mrs morrison when sibyl had gone and then the worthy woman polished her spectacles which had suddenly grown dim End of chapter 4「Thou art the man » by Mary Elizabeth Braddon Chapter 5 From the Far Off Land Sibyl's own particular retreat was in a tower at the southern angle of Ellerslie House, and it was one of the prettiest rooms in a house where beauty and harmony of furniture and decoration had been achieved regardless of cost, and with the aid of all the new lights which high art has cast upon our domestic surroundings. The room was octagonal, and the eight panels accommodated frescoes of the four seasons, alternated with four allegorical figures representing dawn, noon, evening, and night, these executed in a decidedly French manner at which sturdy English art might lift the nose and shrug the shoulder of contempt but for which decorative purposes was admirable madras curtains of pale amber chairs and sofa covered with sea green silk piano tables bookshelves and mantelpiece all in white enameled wood gave delicate brightness to the room which was lighted by four tall casement windows overlooking sea and moor and the village of Ardliston straggling along the edge of the cliff, with its snug little harbour sunk deep into the hollow of the hills. Sibyl could see all the outer world for which she cared from these four windows. She had spent an occasional summer at Scarborough, and she had seen the glory of the English lakes, but the world she loved was the world of far-reaching moorland and far-reaching ocean at half-past two on that summer afternoon marie arnold stood in the golden light while her wondering eyes slowly made the circuit of the room and then concentrated their gaze upon the owner of these luxurious surroundings who stood smiling at her a gracious figure a pale sweet face a tall slip of a girl slenderly formed and with only the promise of beauty a figure and face which were both curiously contrastive with the strongly built and well-rounded form brilliant black eyes and vivid colouring of the young woman from the sunny south sibyl asked her if she could speak English, she replied modestly, very little. 
but her father was an englishman all the same she informed sibyl and she hoped to earn learn english very quickly ah oh, mais no 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 cried sibyl learn very slowly do not learn at all she went on in her pretty girlish english french i am going to talk french with you always i shall get along so much faster with you than with fraulein because you will never correct me you will not will you marie you won't take the faintest notice of my faults in grammar and you will only stop me when i am so bad that you can't tell what i mean is that a bargain but mademoiselle speaks like an angel protested marie with her pretty southern flattery <laughs> no no i am wretched as to grammar Fraulein stops me every minute, first a wrong tense, then a wrong gender, and then the form of the sentence is all wrong, and then I have to say devant when it should have been avant, or sauf when I should have said except. As if it mattered, that is not the way to teach a girl to speak a foreign language. The way is to let her talk and talk and talk as the birds sing until her instinct teaches her what is right and what is wrong come and sit on my sofa marie isn't it a darling sofa and tell me all about yourself and the country where you were born marie sighed and obeyed and presently they were sitting on the sofa the fair head close beside the dark shining hair that had grown in the sun and which always had sunny gleams even in its darkness the large dark eyes had golden lights in them as if they too had taken beauty from the southern sun tell me tell me all urged sibyl always in french delighted to be able to talk without apprehension of the fraulein's nice criticism unless it grieves you to talk of your home no no mamselle it does not grieve me i have wept all my tears i have wept my fears since my mother died just a fortnight ago only a fortnight and my mother died only a year ago ah i can feel for you and the white slim hand stole into the french girl's coarser hand and tears rained from sibyl's violet eyes the very name mother was a charm to make her weep she was not always kind mamselle but i was sorry all the same when she died she was only ill for a few days and she was unconscious toward the last so that we could never say good-bye she drifted out of life in a long sleep and i was left alone there in our little villa at Mourgin, alone with the poor dead mother knowing not knowing what was to become of me any more than the great white cat she had been fond of knew what was going to come become of him had you no uncles and aunts and people inquired sibyl wonderingly she was so richly provided with relatives upon the allendale side of her house to say nothing of numerous humbler higginsons that she could not imagine an existence unsurrounded by kith and kin no mamselle i have no one and i never heard that my mother had any friend in this world except sir higginson you mean my father sir joseph yes sir joseph higginson but how did your mother so far away happen to win my father's friendship inquired sibyl her husband was an engineer who worked under sir higginson when he was establishing great iron works at fontaine le roi near the belgian frontier 
explained Marie Arnold. That was many years ago, before I was born. My father was killed one night in the railway six months before I was born, and Sir Higginson was very good to my mother. She was not a peasant, mademoiselle, and yet she was not quite a lady. She had no thought when my father married her, and she never learned to work for her bride. When she was left a widow with an infant, she was quite helpless. She would have starved, perhaps, if your father had not taken pity upon her. Your husband was killed while he was in my service, he told her, and I shall provide for you the rest of your days. And he kept his word nobly. My mother went back to her own country before I was born, and we lived in a little white house at Mourgin, looking over the hills and the pine woods and the sea. Where is Mourgin? It is a little town on a hill near Caen. Mademoiselle knows come, perhaps. No, but I have heard my aunts and cousins talk of it. Some of them go there every winter. And so you were reared near Caen, on the shores of the Mediterranean. I suppose you think that the sea over there is very ugly in comparison, said Sybil, pointing to the ocean she loved. It is greyer than our sea, mademoiselle and it always looks like our sea in bad weather. And what do you think of our hills and moors? asked Sibyl with a somewhat peremptory air. Very ugly, mademoiselle. I miss the rolling olive woods, the cypresses, the valleys where the roses grow. I miss the perfumed air, the sunshine most of all. Don't you call that sunshine? asked Sibyl, pointing to the southward windows. Very fair for a sunny day in February, mademoiselle, not for June. Ah, in June, no doubt, your mouja would be simply intolerable, like a sandy desert in Africa. No, mademoiselle, there is always a cool breeze across the hills, a breath from the unseen snow mountains, and there is always a shade in the pine woods, always freshness from the sea. It is only foreigners who fancy they cannot live in our country in the summer. Did my father ever come to see you at Mougin? Yes, mademoiselle, years and years ago, before I went to the convent. What convent? You're not a nun, are you? Marie, Marie laughed for the first time in Sibyl's hearing. No, mademoiselle, but I was educated at a convent at Grasse. Is that far from Mougin? Only a few miles. You can see one place from the other across the valley. I used to look from the convent windows, and I could almost distinguish the green shutters and the red roof of my mother's house and the pink blossom of the almond trees in the garden. And so you were educated at a convent. How odd. I am a Roman Catholic. Mademoiselle, in most Roman Catholic children are educated in convents. Well, you are to be in the schoolroom, my father says. I am to make myself useful in some way, mademoiselle, Sir Joseph said when I saw him in London. Did you see him quite lately? Sibyl asked eagerly. Yes, mademoiselle, he sent a person, his private secretary, I believe, to take me to England directly after my mother's funeral. Ah, yes, yes, old Mr. Orlebar. I know him very well. 
he lives here when father is at home a funny old man isn't he he was very kind to me mamselle all through the long journey and then he took me to a beautiful house like a palace almost in london where i saw sir joseph and he was very kind and he told me he would always be my friend as long as i conducted myself properly and he wrote a letter to his housekeeper and then i stayed one night in that splendid house and saw the picture gallery and all the beautiful things in the great salon and early next morning mr Arlebar took me to the station he put me on the train and told me what i was to do when i came to the end of my railway journey and that is all my history mademoiselle poor marie sighed sibyl ever so compassionately i am so sorry for you and if your mother was not always kind to you still she must have loved you her only child and you must have loved her sibyl had been wondering at marie's dry eyes since she herself could hardly speak of her dead mother without a rush of tears marie hung her head and paused before she replied i loved some of the nuns better than i loved my mother she faltered mother anastasie for instance ah she was so good to me it almost broke my heart to leave the convent because of parting with her i used to walk over to the grass to the convent sh chapel every saint's day but it was to see mother anastasie that i went so far for i could have heard mass in our church at Mougin. she was always pale and delicate and they said there was something wrong with her heart but she taught me more and worked harder than any of the nuns she taught music and drawing all the children loved her and i do not think one of them loved her better than i and just a year ago in corpus christi i went to the convent and missed her in her place at the organ and after the service one of the lay sisters came to me with her eyes streaming and took me by the hand and held me to the burial ground where there was a newly made grave heaped of roses she could scarcely speak for sobbing but at last she told me how mother anastasie had been found only two days before sitting at the chapel organ in the afternoon sunshine her hands still upon the keys but her head fallen back against the edge of the high oak chair she had died like that mademoiselle alone no one near her they had heard the sound of the organ cease after she had played one of mozart's finest glorias as they walked in the garden in their recreation hour and they thought that the mother anastasie was staying in the chapel for prayer and meditation meditation they watched the chapel door hoping she would come out in time to take a little walk with them but the bell rang for the class and they left the garden it was an hour later before anyone took the alarm and went to work and would look for her marie's eyes were no longer tearless and her last words were made almost inaudible by her emotion you must have loved her very dearly said sibyl full of sympathy yes mademoiselle she was my spiritual mother the mother of my mind and my soul 
if i were to live to be ever so old i think i could never commit a sin without her image rising up before me to stop me from wickedness my own mother was fond of me in her way but she was oh so different from mother to anastasie she loved gossiping cards and pleasures of all kinds she did not care for books or flowers or pictures she went to high mass every sunday morning but that was all she sat about on the walls or in the olive woods with her neighbors all the rest of the week except when she could get any one to drive her to car to see the fine shops and fine people she was not often unkind to you questioned sibyl no she was not often unkind and she never beat me sibyl shuddered at the idea of a mother beating her child she whose only image of motherhood was an image of supreme gentleness but her pleasures were not my pleasures pursued the french girl there was no link between us and the two years that I spent at Mougin after I left the convent were the dullest years of my life. I missed my old companions and the music and games and the studies even, though I used once to think them a burden, and my soul sickened at the gossip and the cards and the quarrels and quarrels about nothing, a cracked oil jar handful of vegetables loud talking from one door to other quarrels that seemed to begin and go on for the sake of quarrelling poor marie there are no quarrels here fraulein is rather worrying and but miss minchin is as good as gold in spite of her fidgety little ways i call her mousy because she is brownish gray and quick and quiet like a mouse but she doesn't mind and you must not call her mousy not just at first no no mademoiselle that is understood replied marie discreetly this was the beginning of a lasting friendship which grew with the passage of time marie was accepted in the schoolroom as a useful companion alike by governesses and pupil she had been taught to use her needle with exquisite art and the fraulein was not above getting her handkerchiefs marked by those skilful fingers in return for which service she helped marie to acquire a little german without taking the trouble to give her formal lessons marie was quick and learnt any new thing with wondrous ease she had a fine ear for music and she delighted in sibyl's piano as a companion in sibyl's walks she was incomparable for she knew not weariness and her light springy step carried her over the moorland as easily as if she had been some wild creature reared upon those breezy downs she was sibyl's friend and playfellow for five years with sir joseph higginson's approval and it was only now when sibyl had attained her eighteenth birthday and all of the mountford aunts were beginning to pester sir joseph about her appearance in society that he began to wonder how he was to dispose of the humble companion when the heiress came to take her proper position in the great world it is all very well to keep sibyl back for a year or so said the only unmarried aunt lady selina mountford who took upon herself to advise all her married sisters their husbands and belongings and used to lie awake at night in her pretty little house in mayfair worrying herself about the family troubles it is all very well for you to keep her buried alive at ellerslie for another year as your heiress 
she will have a choice of eligible parties whenever she might appear but she ought to come out before she is twenty she looks rather thin and delicate at present i think another year may improve her said lady selina as if she were talking of a turkey that has being fattened for christmas or a young horse that was furnishing sir joseph promised to bring out his daughter before she was twenty and thus upon one subject at least freed lady selina's knights from care ah there is always something to keep me awake sighed the spencer spinster braemar's boys are too terrible how is he ever to pay their oxford debts passes my comprehension and now i am told they play baccarat at some dreadful club in london where young men who have no money lose twenty thousand pounds at a sitting and felix threatened his father that he would marry a girl he met at the stephanotis another dreadful club where they dance there was another year of respite for sir joseph during which he might be able to find a comfortable settlement in the matrimonial line for the humble companion so that she might not too keenly feel the difference in her position and that of sibyl as sovereign mistress of the house in arlington street and with all the e town eager to pay her homage i don't want her to feel the difference used sir joseph with a profound sigh as he paced the terrace in front of his tudor mansion it wouldn't be fair that she should it wouldn't be fair he sighed again deeply for as yet no eligible pretendant to the hand of mary arnold had appeared in that remote northern region and he began to fear that none might be found in the district the girl was a papist objection number one but an objection which had been disregarded by a needy evangelical curate who on ascertaining that sir joseph meant to give his dependent a handsome dowry amount not specified had urged his desire to make her his wife and possibly to snatch a brand from the burning by winning her over to the evangelical church the alliance would have been respectable as the young levite though needy was of a good northumberland family and of unpeachable morals but marie did not like the curate and would not hear of marrying him i shall never marry she told sir joseph i want to be sibyl's slave and companion always my dear girl that is all very well while sibyl is here replied sir joseph but when she goes to london and is swallowed up in the gaieties of the london season with hardly an hour of leisure for home life you can't be her companion then let me be her maid then and wait upon her and sit up for her at night and help her undress and hear all about her pleasures and gaieties no marie not a servant you must never be her servant you must never think of yourself as a servant i want to see you happily married before sibyl marries you are six years older than sibyl four and twenty you must have been in love half a dozen times i should think never said marie with an emphatic shrug i have even tried to fall in love with the curate not this one but the tall good-looking young man who was here before him and whose sympathies were all with my church with that young doctor du doctor du snap son and assistant but there is no such thing as love in my nature i think i adore sibyl and i love you and that is all the love i am capable of feeling ah we shall see marie trees that are long and flowering bear very fine blossoms the aloe for example instance and the magnolia 
said Sir Joseph, patting her shoulder as he trudged along by her side. A sturdy, active man, although his seventieth birthday had been kept by the pitmen with beef and beer and noisy rural sports and dancing and fireworks nearly a year before. He was very fond of Marie Arnold. He liked to have her to sit with him and his daughter of an evening. He liked to hear her sing her pretty French chanson, full of coquetry and dainty love, blue skies and sunlit valleys, fountains, orange trees, eglantine and honeysuckle, bees and butterflies, songs that touched none of life's serious phases, nor ever hinted at old age or death. In this springtide of Sir Joseph's seventy-first year, he happened to be at Ellerslie for a short time, with Marie as his only companion, and this companionship drew them nearer together than they had ever been before. Never until now had Sir Joseph been at Ellerslie without his young daughter to hang upon his footsteps, and ride and drive with him, and play billiards with him, or sing and play to him of an evening. Marie had been a secondary figure while Sybil was present, but when April began, Sybil was at Hastings, whither she had been dispatched suddenly at Dr. Dewsnap's instigation to cure a cough which had hung upon her all the winter. There were great things being done in the pits, alterations and extensions which required Sir Joseph's supervision, so he had been unable to go with his daughter who had been confined to the care of Miss Minchin, Fräulein Stahlherz, having gone back to her native Hanover, and for the first time in his widowhood he found himself pacing the long drawing-room at Ellerslie, or taking his morning constitutional on the terrace, without that graceful figure near at hand. She was to come home as soon as the cough was actually cured, by warrant of the Hastings doctor, and in the meantime she wrote to her father daily, telling him of all her walks and rides, her excursions to the battle or to Pevensey, her readings of the Norman conquest in Thierry, Green, and Freeman, and her longing to return to her father and Ellerslie. His life in that great house would have been very dreary, for he had no visitors at this time, and his secretary, Mr. Orlebar, was not a very lively person. If he had not found Marie an attentive and vivacious companion, pleased to do all that Sybil was accustomed to do for him. Mrs. Morrison shrugged her shoulders when she saw the foreign waif filling the absent daughter's place. She liked Marie, but she disapproved of that young person's exaltation. He told me not to give her any fine notions when she first came here, mused the housekeeper, and now he is giving her fine notions himself. A young woman who spends all her evenings in the long drawing room will never be contented to take a humble position in after life. It was not more than three or four days after Sybil left Ellerslie when a stranger appeared upon the scene, a gentleman who called upon Sir Joseph one afternoon and sent in his card, upon which appeared the name of Brandon Mountford, Travellers Club. Any Mountford was secure of a welcome from Sir Joseph, who was never tired of showing kindness to his wife's kindred, but... The name of Brandon touched him with a curious thrill, which was closely akin to pain. Brandon was the name of the distant cousin to whom Lucy Mountford had given the innocent love of her young heart. That Brandon Mountford had died in India two years after Lady Lucy's death, but she had left a son and in all probability this was the son 
these thoughts went swiftly through sir joseph's brain as he looked at the card which had been brought to him in his study the room in which he interviewed agents and tenants and transacted business of all kinds connected with his estate mr mountford is in the drawing-room i suppose he said i'll go to him he found the stranger standing in front of a wide window looking landwards over the valley and the river winding through it a man of about eight and twenty sir joseph thought tall well set up and with a fine frank countenance well-cut features the mountford nose which inclined to the aquiline bright blue eyes light brown hair curling close to the well-shaped head and a complexion tanned by a hotter sun than ever shone upon cumbrian cliffs i am very glad to see you at ellerslie mr mountford said the old man cordially holding out a broad hand in friendly welcome come to have a look at our north country i suppose you must come and put up here for a week or two and let me show you a coal pit if you've never seen one you are too good sir joseph but i haven't come here with any intention of quartering myself upon you though i have come to ask you a favour here's braemar's letter to vouch for me as an insignificant but not disreputable member of the house of mountford i happened to hear from him of your splendid salmon river and was seized with a longing to cast a fly in the waters he praised so warmly brandon mountford here produced an unsealed letter over which sir joseph ran his eye carelessly you want to have a go at our salmon well my dear fellow fish away to your heart's content there are plenty of scaly gentlemen but they are deuced shy and you may be up at five o'clock every morning for a week and yet not early enough to catch them then after a few blank days perhaps you may get a run of luck i used to enjoy the sport myself thirty years ago when i was still young enough to wade breast high in the river in a scotch mist from seven in the morning to seven at night and relish my dinner and my whisky toddy all the better for the day's work where are you staying mr mountford at the higginson arms at ardliston hmm, a cosy old inn and a capital landlady but i think we can make you rather more comfortable at ellerslie you'd better go and fetch your portmanteau indeed sir joseph i had no idea protested mountford you will be nearer the salmon pursued his ho host and i can give you a keeper who knows every yard of the water you'll find this house uncommonly quiet for i am here on business and have invited no one since christmas my daughter is away and i have only a sort of adopted niece who cuts my newspapers for me and reads me to sleep after dinner a nice bright girl who sings charmingly sir joseph grew suddenly thoughtful what if this brandon mountford who had dropped from the clouds were the very man he wanted an honest man a husband for marie arnold he liked the look of the young man a gentleman to the tips of his fingers good blood showed itself in every line and a face and figure penniless no doubt the mountforts were all poor property in ireland for the most part family numerous chieftain weighted down by innumerable portions and allowances to daughters and younger sons bramer tells me you have travelled in africa said sir joseph glancing at the letter in his hand and that you have won some renown already as a hunter of big game 
my gun is my only road to fame sir joseph yes i have spent five years on the dark continent you must have gone there very young i sailed for the cape soon after my twenty-first birthday and within a year of my father's death africa has been my country from that time to this i am only in england as a visitor you mean to go back ah yes i mean to go home a strange fancy for a young man with all the world before him i know no grander world than the shores of zambezi no happier life than the freedom of the wilderness you can tell me your adventures over a glass of mouton to-night go and get your portmanteau you are too kind sir joseph but are you sure i shan't be in the way if you have come to the north on business you may find yourself bored by a visitor i never put myself in the way of being bored answered the old man bluntly you may be sure i shouldn't ask you if i didn't want you here then i shall be delighted to come said mountford i only regret that i shall not see my young cousin bramer was full of her praises she's a good little girl said sir joseph i don't think my life would be worth sixpence a day without her and then his thoughts went back to the girl's mother and to those far-away days when he sat by lady lucy's side in the hartford street drawing-room and she told him of her little story of a misplaced love was this brandon mountford the son of that brandon mountford he wondered nervously anxious to be enlightened your father was in the army i think he said tentatively yes in the engineers he died in india as brave a soldier as ever fought there and your mother is she no longer living the young man's face flushed at the question and a troubled look came into his eyes my mother died many years ago while i was at wellington she had been a great invalid ever since my birth he answered with painful pauses in the final sentence sir joseph felt that he had been cruel to push the question but he had wanted to be sure of his facts and now he was sure this man was the son of that distant cousin to whom lucy's young heart had gone out and who doubtless had given her love for love the man so unhappily mated so faithful to that tragic bond if i can do him a good turn i will thought sir joseph he shan't go back to africa if i can hinder it he would make a capital husband for marie they would be a splendid couple brandon thought brought his portmanteau and fishing tackle to ellerslie in the course of the afternoon and dined alone with sir joseph in a snug tapestried parlour which the millionaire preferred to the great dining-room with its lofty carved oak buffet and decoration of gold plate the two men sat a long time over their wine though brandon did but just small justice to sir joseph's famous mouton he was a tremendous smoker however and consumed nearly a dozen cigarettes while sir joseph entertained him with reminiscences of his juvenile struggles and the hazards and successes of his manhood it was late when they went to the long drawing-room and brandon who had forgotten his host's mention of an adopted niece was startled at seeing a young woman neatly dressed in black silk with a bunch of tea-roses at her waistband seated reading near a lamp-lit table she had not dined with them yet she had the air of being one of the family sir joseph introduced mr mountford to this young lady 
who was called Miss Arnold, yet who spoke with a French accent, and whose dark eyes and warm olive complexion were decidedly un-English. "'And now, Marie, you can sing us one of your little songs,' said Sir Joseph, settling himself in a luxurious chair, with evident resignation to an impending slumber. He was asleep before Marie had finished her first song, and Brandon and the young lady were practically alone, a fact which seemed less embarrassing to her than to the man not long returned from Mashonaland and from a society which bulk, beads, and blackness are the chief characteristics of female beauty. It was a new thing for Brandon to find himself in a solitude of two with a handsome young woman whose history, associations, and character were utterly unknown to him. She sang the inevitable Si tu savais with a good deal of feeling and in a rich contralto vo voice, and then De Morse Ninon, and then a little Provençal ballade, and then another at Brandon's urgent request. When he could not with decency ask her to sing any more, he entreated her to play something. Chopin, Talbert, Strauss, Sebastian Bach, Porpora, Lully, anything she chose. He would have kept her at the piano all the evening if he could, rather than face the ordeal of conversation with the strange young person. But she rose and shook her head at the question of playing. I am no pianist, she said. I have never played anything but my own accompaniment. Mrs. Higginson plays magnificently. I should never dare to attempt the piano where she is. I learned to play after I was grown up. What kind of music does Mrs. Higginson prefer? asked Brandon. Oh, all the great masters. Beethoven, Mozart, Mendelssohn, Chopin, and she extemporizes exquisitely. The piano to her is a living creature, her most intimate friend. She and her piano talk to each other for hours together. I can only sit in a corner with my needlework and wonder at her. She is far away from me in another world. Ah, uh, yes, my little girl has a genius for music said Sir Joseph, awakened at once by the cessation of song, and Marie has a fine voice and a pretty taste, hasn't she, Mountford? Brandon said all that was proper and complimentary about Miss Arnold's singing, and felt infinitely relieved by the worthy baronet's return to consciousness and conversation. I hope I'm may have the pleasure of hearing Miss Higginson play before I leave Ellerslie, he said presently. Does she return soon? That depends on her doctor. She is not to leave Hastings without his permission. Ah, oh, you must miss her sadly. I would be lost without her if it weren't for Marie. She takes care of me. She's like a second daughter to me. By the way, Marie... Mr. Urquhart is coming in a day or two. Don't forget to tell Morrison to have his room ready. Marie's cheek and brow crimsoned, and the dark, strongly arched brows contracted in a frown. What brings Mr. Urquhart here again so soon? The same attraction that brings Mr. Mountfort, my Salmon River. He will be company for you, Mountfort, added Sir Joseph to his guest. Urquhart's brother, Lord Penrith, is a neighbor of mine. Urquhart lost his wife only a year ago, married badly, a poor parson's daughter, 
and he contrives to spend a good deal of his life at Calander Castle. It suits him uncommonly well, you understand, for he has my shooting and fishing as well as his brother's. Brandon watched Marie Arnold's face while Sir Joseph was talking, and wondered at the angry and troubled look which clouded a countenance that had been gay and smiling a few minutes before. There must be some strong reason for her dislike of Mr. Urquhart, he told himself, and he became more interested in the girl's character and history from this moment. End of chapter 5